Well, good morning and thank you uh, for your welcome. Um, I think I was last here at the beginning of March before lockdown, so everyone looks a little bit different um, <laughs> than when I was last here with the masks on. But it's good to be back and I'll bring greetings from uh, Amy and Park 2. It's good to share God's word with you this morning. Um, and I would like to draw your attention and Mark's prayer is very appropriate to those verses in uh, verses 19 to 25 in James chapter 1. So please uh, turn back with me to those. And whilst you're looking, I just want to just warm, warm up where James has gone so far earlier in the chapter. Uh, he's been explaining uh, to his readers um, trials uh, and the context of trials for the Christian life. And he immediately introduces um, to them that their faith, our faith, is something that grows and matures. That God has a formula for the growth of our faith, which is trials. And to operate rightly in trials, we need wisdom. And in order to, to act wisely in trials, we need to have our eyes opened. We need to have open eye, eyes to the trials we're encountering, and we're to remain focused on the law whilst we're in them. He also tells them that trials are complex. They're real life. They're not theory. They're not scenarios you can write down in advance and map out how to act and do. They're real life. It's a cauldron of pressures and difficulties, and within them, we are often our own biggest enemy. And that whilst we're in them, God is the only source of good for us, and it's he who is transforming us in them. And that's the background as we get uh, to verse 19, as James is speaking to the believers who are reading his letter. And it seems like he's changing direction in verse 19, but he's really... Um, having that in the background and building a problem um, that the believers he sees and the churches he's writing to have. So do have that in your background, in the background of your minds, uh, transforming through trials as we get to verses 19 to 25. And this morning we've got two points and two applications at the end. And the two points are taking us through verses 19 to 25. And the first point is this. Who is doing the talking in the church? Who is doing the talking in the churches that James is writing to? And in verses 19 to 21, James gives a very straightforward answer. In verse 21, he says that God should be doing the talking, the implanted word. God is the one who should be doing the talking. But there is a problem in these first three verses for the churches and to whom James is writing and that is that God cannot get an ed, a word in edgeways. And I just want to paint a bit of picture. If we take these three verses and just perhaps play them in the inverse, so we see a little bit of perhaps the situation James is talking into, and we get some clues other parts of the letter, as the sorts of situations he's talking about. So bear with me, and as you see these verses, you'll sort of see, um, and other bits of James, you'll see where this is coming from. So to James, he's talking to people and to churches that are filled with talkers and speakers and teachers. And we get this also in James 3 verse 1. People he's talking to, they all want to be teachers. They all want to be at the front and in charge. And James warns them later about doing this because they face stricter accountability. But these are the people he's, he's talking to. It's the churches are being filled with these sorts of people. They feel like they should be in the position to teach. And they should be able to teach others, and they are doing the talking. They have much to impart to others, and they have little to learn. They're, if you like, quick, quick to speak and slow to listen. And they're easily provocable. Easily provocable, proud and unyielding. They seem to fight on every issue. doesn't matter what's presented. It's taken personally, and it's taken as a threat to them. And it's because there's a spirit amongst them, a spirit of anger. They are quick to be angry, easily provoked. And it wrestles them into submission. It takes them over and it drives them into bad sin. Verse 20. Doesn't produce the righteousness of God. And then what happens in verse 21? Rampant wickedness. It's not so much that they sin, it's that the sin takes them over. They're a runaway train. It's rampant. 
it's almost like the red mist descends on them. You know, when you get into a maybe a disagreement with somebody and we talk of the red mist, don't we? Suddenly the, the whole context of the world changes. We've been taken over by something and we become a runaway train of, of, of anger and sin. And suddenly things that maybe in the cold night of day we would have said we would never do suddenly become very justified in our own minds because we've been wrestled into submission by our own anger. And, it, and herein lies the problem. When this happens, James says, where's the growth in godliness? Where is this transforming work? Where's the transformed life that they should be living? It's gone. And in fact, cannot come, it cannot produce the righteousness of God. Because God cannot get a word in edgeways. God's word in verse 21 is being declared. That's why he says, receive the implanted word. It is there. It is being declared. They are receiving it in one sense. But they're not listening. In fact, it seems as if the word is, is what is causing the combustion. Because it is being declared, but they're not receiving it as it ought to be received. Because they get angry. They're sensitive to it. They're easily offended and easily provoked. And so God's word seems to be being cast aside and they're the ones that do the teaching and the talking. And ironically, rather than them doing the talking and the teaching and it produces righteousness, it produces the complete opposite. It leads them into rampant wickedness. So then, verses 19 to 21, as James takes it, what is, and that's the situation, what is it that he tells them to do? He tells them very simply to do the opposite. He tells them to verse 19, they need to be quick to hear and slow to speak. They want the transformation of God. They need to be quick to hear and slow to speak. And to be quick to hear here, James isn't saying Listen quickly, so in the sense of when someone starts talking, stop what you're doing, listen to them. It doesn't mean you do it first, it's not a priority. He actually says the word means to be docile and easily won over. So when someone's talking to you and sharing um, God's word, it's to be receptive and easily persuaded by what God has to say. And the sense of slow to talk is not talking slowly it's not using slow it's not sort of talking as if people don't understand you it's not even to do with um waiting to take your turn so it's not to say when others are speaking well don't go first you wait and you'll have your say at the end when others have finished actually the word means thoughtfulness or care so it's the idea of before you say anything, make sure you know and you're thinking about what you are going to say. And James here then is creating an environment, isn't he? An environment for learning. One in which words that are spoken are careful, thoughtful, they're considered. And the one who is listening is open, receptive and calm. Be slow to anger, James says. In this environment, you keep your passions under control. You keep your pride, your sense of self-importance and those things in check as you are listening and when you're speaking. I think a good example of this um, is Naaman. If you remember Naaman in Two Kings, the Syrian general, um, he's a great example because he's a powerful general. He's famed. Amongst the ancient world, he's important, he's extremely wealthy, but he's a leper. And as you, if you're familiar with the story, he hears from an Israelite servant girl that he's captured and is in his household, and that there's a prophet in Israel who can heal him of his leprosy. And so he goes on a big journey, a big caravan goes with him of riches and wealth. And he turns up expecting either a magic show, he's expecting a bit like if you remember Paul Daniels from yesteryear, a big scene. And somehow he'll magically be healed. He's either expecting that because that's what he's used to or a grand gesture. Elisha will say, if you pay a million billion pounds, I will do something amazing for you. 
Oh, he's expecting a pilgrimage, some sort of humiliation, some sort of something that can earn his healing. But instead, he arrives at Elisha's door and he's treated as a leper in 2 Kings 5 and verse 11. Elisha doesn't come to the door and gives him what is actually a very simple instruction. It doesn't reflect what Naaman thinks of himself at all. And he becomes insulted and angry and he, the red mist descends. He ignores everything and he storms off back to Syria. And it's his servant who, on the journey back, sort of perhaps very carefully and nervously raises the subject and reasons with him on the basis that you came expecting something hard to get to be healed. Why, when asked something easy, are you refusing to do it? So you get this interesting contrast. You get, if you like, the contrast of the James character, the servant, and you get the problem character of Naaman. Anger descends, the red mist, and even the obvious, why don't you just obey him, becomes an impossible task, and he storms off. That provides a good contrast to the James situation. But all this, James tells us that the anger of man doesn't produce the righteousness of God. Now, as Christians, we have Christ's righteousness in us, don't we? We don't earn our righteousness or make it ourselves. God gives it to us. He imputes it to our account. So James isn't saying if we're not angry, we will create something we don't have. And he's not saying simply not being angry will make us right before God. The issue for James is that by being people who are easily provoked and quick to anger, it doesn't produce in them the evidence of the righteousness of God that's in them. It does the opposite. It produces wickedness. James, in fact, later on, to give an example of this, James talks in chapter 3 and verse 18, that what does the wisdom of God produce? It produces, it's peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. Contrasting what the anger of man does, it produces rampant wickedness. It produces the opposite. It doesn't produce godliness in the person at all. And so if this is how they've been heading and they've been producing this rampant wickedness, what do they need to do? James tells us they need to put it away. Verse 21, put it off. It's the same word he would use if he wanted you to take off an old dirty coat. People who've been, these people who've been caught up in this rampant wickedness, it's not damning because they are Christian people he's talking to. They are righteous, but what they're producing or what they put on is not the righteousness of God. They are producing now and showing something different. They need to take it off. Like an old dirty coat, it needs to be discarded so that the righteousness of God can be seen again. That's in there. It's a reset. A reset is needed for them. And with a reset and in a learning environment, what do you need to put back into that environment of slow to, sp slow to speak, quick to listen, with someone who has unclothed themselves of the corruption of being, of rushing to anger and red mist. Well, they, if you like, put on old and dirty coats, they've now got them off, what they now need into that environment, a new teacher. Not themselves, they need God. They now need to let the word of God that is being sown amongst their midst, that's being taught and applied to them, they need it to now flourish. They need it to have its way with them. They need to be mild, humble, submissive to it as it's spoken. Or as James simply puts it, they need to receive with meekness the implanted word. And this is key because it's the implanted word that's able to save their souls. Not in the, uh, the sense of salvation from God's wrath. That's not what James means because they already have that but of the salvation of the continual healing and remaking of a misshapen 
a mutated person from sin. They need to continually become something new. And James is saying this, the implanted word saves you. It continually makes you more and more into what you ought to be and make you beautiful. So verses 19 to 21, who should be doing, says James, the talking in the church? God should be doing the talking. And for many here, they needed a reset. They had become their own teachers. They had become easily provocable. Runaway trains of sin because of it. They needed a reset, a reestablishment of an environment where God's word could flourish. And then they needed God's word to be listened and received with meekness. Well, point number two. If God is doing the talking, who is doing the doing? Verses 22 to 25. We must be doing the doing and the living, says James. God doesn't speak to educate us and to make us understand more. He speaks and teaches to change us. Here in these verses, James is going to put his finger on a danger, and it's a danger that his own teaching, the previous three verses, can cause a dispassion and academia amongst his hearers. A coolness and passivity to what God is teaching, where passion may no longer be bursting out as anger. Instead, it's just gone. Where the goal of the Christian life is simply a routine of listening and learning. And it's only about knowing things. And in one sense, it's easy to relate to, isn't it? Because if you like, it's an environment that can feel very safe. It's quiet, it's calm, it's studious. It's an environment where people are agreeable. And suddenly that becomes our goal. Suddenly, so long as the church is ordered and calmly operating, we declare success and we just want to keep that experience going. Well, beware the deception, says James. Be, do not deceive yourselves, verse 22. Doers, not hearers only. Hearing is very important. It's not a, a doing, not hearing. It is a hearing and doing. And James, when he talks of a doer, he doesn't mean a doer in terms of listen for the commands and then just do them. Like a soldier, a soldier militaristically obeys. He means something more than this. He means you adopt the word as a manner of life and character. You embody its very essence because after all, the word is implanted. It is in you. So it's not obedience as a militaristic command. It is the flourishing and the embodiment of the very word itself in what you do. This is how Jewish um, rabbinical people familiar, familiar with sort of Jewish discipleship or rabbinical discipleship. To the disciples of Jesus, they were disciples not because they followed him around to understand what he had to say and what he taught so that they could teach others. They followed him around and understood what he taught. And by following him around, they don't just know what he teaches, but his life becomes their life too. That's what it meant for them to be disciples. It wasn't about learning so you could teach others or maybe just learn for yourself. It was learning to become someone. To be a disciple, to become someone else's life in you. James illustrates this in verses 22 to 25. You have a man looking in the mirror and looking, it's, it means to sort of forensically examine in the way a crime scene investigator would harvest all the evidence and with the special hoovers and stuff. It's not just someone looking in the mirror in the way we might look in the mirror. It's not a cursory glance. And verse 24, the person sees what they look like. 
they notice it, they're confronted by it, perhaps it's even alarming. But it ultimately makes no impression because what happens when they turn their face away from the mirror, they immediately forget. It's as if they never looked. However shocking it is that they see of themselves, is only shocking whilst they look in it. And as soon as they turn, it's gone. They may remember perhaps looking in the mirror, but they don't remember what they saw. Regardless of what he sees in the mirror, regardless of what it shows of themselves and the consequence of how they live, because what they're seeing is a consequence of what they've been doing when not looking in the mirror, it doesn't matter. They return and carry on as they were before. Think of a mechanic. Whenever I see, there's nothing against mechanics, by the way. When you see a mechanic, what do you always notice about them? There's around the fingernails and in the fingers, it's always dirty. Because being a mechanic means you get dirty fingers, you get oils, you're dealing with things that soap just can't sometimes get rid of. It gets embedded, it's like it becomes part of their skin. And when they look in the mirror, what they see isn't necessarily they have dirty hands that need washing, they see the consequence of being a mechanic. The dirt becomes part of them. So whilst there's always areas that can't be cleaned, it's their manner of life that makes their hands dirty. And of course, and mechanics don't do this obviously, but of course, the mechanic in one sense is walking away from the mirror and forgetting what they see because they go back to carry on being a mechanic. So the hands, when they next time look, will continue to be dirty. Of course, it's nothing against mechanics there, but you get the point. It's not necessarily the failing to wash. It's because the very pattern of their life leads their hands to be as they are. That's the sense of what James is saying. Hearing, in one sense, is fruitless. Being confronted with the mirror is fruitless. If I don't now persevere and toil in addressing the life that has led me to become the thing that I see reflected. is why in verse 25, when people are confronted with the law of liberty, as James obviously then takes the metaphor away and addresses directly, God's word presents the law of liberty to you like a mirror. The person who's blessed in looking in it isn't the one that looks necessarily or the one that does a quick job. It's the person who perseveres. They toil at it. They change the manner of life and who they are that has led them to see the reflection that they see. They're the ones that complete the transformation journey. A hero who's not just taken steps, but perseveres in those steps again and again and again, the whole way. They're the ones that will over time see a reflection that is different the next time they look. So if God's doing the teaching, if God is the one who is implanting the word, who is doing the doing? Who is doing the doing and the living? It's us, isn't it? We are to do it, to persevere in it, whilst continually confronted with the perfect law we are the ones that have to change. Well, application number one, related to point number one, application number one, we have to have a teachable spirit and bridled passions. <clears throat> what is the spirit that we have, thinking of ourselves? What is the spirit that we have when it comes to being instructed from God's word? Would we see ourselves as being meek, as James requires, difficult to provoke, easily persuadable, ready and willing to be taught from God's word? And do we treat it as superior wisdom? Not conceptually, I find myself, it's very easy isn't it, to say I can be wrong, but you'll probably find that when a situation where you are wrong crops up, suddenly you're not actually really wrong. So there's a concept of being wrong, and there's the reality of actually accepting that I can be wrong at times. 
Do you treat God's word as that superior wisdom? You actually fall on it and you accept I am actually wrong here. Or am I resistant, easy to provoke, and people perhaps avoid talking to you because of it? The first things that come out are complaints, challenges, and confrontation. That's the norm. And you're always waiting to see when it's your turn to put your position across. And your role is to sit in judgment because you have all the answers. Is that you? And maybe it's difficult to analyze because I know when we get positioned with these sorts of questions, we immediately think of the scenarios of, well, I complain because in that instance, the teaching perhaps was, was poor. And I challenged because on that instance, there was something in there that was erroneous, it was wrong. And I confronted in that scenario because there was a danger. It might be true. But it's not covering what is probably the extremely rare scenarios where there is something that may need to be done. It's the general spirit and attitude that we have that James is tackling. Are we the first ones to always find fault? We sit in judgment, and that means that as the word is declared, I'm the gatekeeper to the congregation. I nod along and our men what I agree with, and I tuck and I shake when I hear something that, no, that's, that doesn't conform with my understanding. When we enter into the discussions of church life, we're the impossible ones to persuade or win round. We are a politician in our answers, and we, we cannot admit being wrong. We always have a clever get out court clause in how we deal with it. We always have the final word, so we're right in our own eyes and right at least towards others. And when we really feel exposed, we disengage, we switch off, we put the head down, we remove ourselves from the situation because in this case, we're vulnerable. Is that us? We the ones that also struggle to contain our anger and rage. It sort of bursts out very quickly and easily in what we say to others and what we do. Maybe we're in their presence or at least maybe behind closed doors where we feel less embarrassed. Does it cloud our judgment? Do we find that actually we too can run into the runaway train of wickedness? Things that if someone positioned the scenario to us in a, in a Bible study... We would nod along to the appropriate measures being proposed. But when we're in the situation ourselves, we're the atomic bomb that goes off, causing endless amounts of damage and taking action that in the Bible study we would never have thought justified or justifiable. If that's us, or even maybe we, we can take it, but the anger isn't there. We're just entirely switched off to the world. We're switched off. So what God is saying, the anger may not be there, but I'm completely disinterested unless it is telling me what I want to know. If so, there's a warning here, isn't there? A strong warning because it's not producing the righteousness of God. In fact, it leads us into more dangerous, into dangerous situations if we become the source of rampant wickedness. We have to hit the reset button. We need to put things off. That's a very strong word, isn't it? To take something off. We have to unbecome something. We need, don't we, in our own lives, in our church lives, to foster that culture of meekness. People who are easily persuaded, not gullible and foolish, that's not to be easily persuaded, but easily persuaded, open to reason, to what God has to say. So that the word that's implanted has fertile ground, it isn't resisted in its work. It's encouraged by us to blossom and flourish. And where our words are carefully and thoughtfully considered, they're not rash, emotional, and angry. Because this is how we grow. It's about letting God do the talking in our hearts and lives.
Application number two. We need to aim to change, not necessarily, or certainly not just aim to learn. How do we measure the success in Christian life? Assuming I hope we all self-examine. Do we look at ourselves 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago, three years ago, one year ago, maybe just before the pandemic? How do we see progress in ourselves? How do we see that we are not just going on, if you like, with the Lord in the sense of I was a five year old, if you like a child Christian last year, and I'm still a child Christian now. In one sense, we that's still going on in the Lord. But I'm still the same age in my Christian life. I was a child then and I'm a child now. As a child 20 years ago, I'm a child in the faith now. I haven't grown up. How do we measure our success? How do you measure your success? When I'm at work, I encounter a very common problem. And that's people measure and evaluate the wrong things when determining success. And consequently, I had this quite a few times a few years ago, because they then become, because they then believe in the wrong things to measure success, they only recognize that it was wrong when they hit the iceberg of the Titanic and disaster hits. And it's usually caused because they're evaluating whether they're doing the right things, but not whether they are achieving the right outcomes. Think of it like when cooking, if you ever watch MasterChef, if you ever, it's like um, Marcus Waring down as the professionals, doesn't he, with, with Greg Wallace, if you ever watched it, Marcus Waring, a famous two Michelin star chef. What does he do, or what do the customers do in a restaurant when they have the food? They don't go into the kitchen and they ask the chef, did you, did you sear the beef before putting it in the oven to slow roast for two and a half hours? Yes or no? Did you put the right herbs in it? Did you chop them finely enough? Did you put the potatoes in at the right time? Have they been peeled properly? That may be what the recipe says, but the customers don't judge on that and neither does Marcus Waring in MasterChef, the professionals. No one really actually cares at the end of the day about the recipe, do they, in cooking? They get their fork, they put it into the dish, and they eat it. Because the point of the recipe is the dish at the end. And they won't mind the fact that you don't follow the recipe if the dish at the end is what it should be. Are we falling, if you like, into the pits that James warns us of? Hearers, not doers. Right things, right recipe, but we haven't measured to make sure that the recipe is delivering the growth that we are to experience. Remember, doing isn't just necessarily following a command like a soldier. It's a pattern of life, the implanted word, blossoming. Three, I want to do just three quick bullet points of a scenario of hearing. A good hearer might look like this. You know, someone following a recipe. You're here, and these are pre-pandemic. I put these to be pre-pandemic because we're unlocking. So you imagine you're here every Sunday, morning, afternoon, evening. You're at the midweek meetings. You're always there. You're old faithful. You're attentive. You're listening. You're taking notes. You're confronted by the word of God. You're hit. You're impacted. You're, whoa, this is, there are things in here I need to think about. You're cut by it. You're reading and praying every day. You're attentive. You're thoughtfully reading. You're praying through your reading. You're learning. You're listening to God. And again, you're confronted. You're challenged each morning by what God's word has to say. You're meeting with others. There are several in the announcement. Lots of prayer meetings and Bible studies. You're there. You're at each one. You're talking with people. You're talking with Philip. You're talking with the other elders and the other office bearers about difficult subjects interesting things you're trying to reason with them understand how it is that the christian should live and behave and you're confronted and challenged about things in your life but you're not changed you can look back and you go well the meetings were there the sundays were there i listened i've got my notes filed on my study desk i'm committed to the hearing and it's great because I can see the, the story of my hearing. 
but I'm no different for it. I'm never any different. I've got 20 years of a story of listening, but I seem to have no years of growing from it. Right activity, wrong outcomes. Or are we doers, not hearers only? So more bullet points, not perfect, of doing. Maybe you're hearing a sermon, perhaps on being quick to hear and slow to speak. And maybe you're confronted and alarmed. You've sort of felt a, a sympathy with the, the, the bad character and realised that aspects, I'm sorry, all of them, but aspects of it may be you. You realise that you may be the one who is, sees themselves as the teacher in the church. You're the dominating influence. You sometimes get roused into anger. You look back and you can see destruction that you've caused, either just with other people or personally, or what the destruction done in your own life. Things needlessly escalated. A dirty coat of rampant wickedness in some form has been being put on. And you realize that reset needs to take place. You sit down quietly one evening, you pray through these things, you work these things through in prayer. You go, why is it? You're the forensic examiner. Why is it when I look in the law of liberty that I am easily provoked? Why is this me? And with the Lord and maybe in talking to others, you, you write these things down. You go, these things are wrong. And I need to put these right. And you don't let yourself hide behind the excuses of, well, sometimes it's justified. You go, no, I, I can't pretend that those occasions were always the right thing to do. You then take steps to address them. You then start becoming the quick to hear and slow to speak. You then start guarding yourself in your passions and emotions. And sometimes things don't go right because it's a perseverance activity. Sometimes there'll still be the, but you're changing. You're going forward with the Lord. The dirty coat is coming off and the new teacher is being instated. Doing not only hearing. I want to close with this. Real life isn't a classroom. It's when I, when I was preparing this, and I've done some earlier ones, other sermons in James. James really emphasizes that real life isn't a classroom. It's not a theory. Real life is emotional. It's costly. You have real choices have real experience consequences. And to live the life of faith, we don't need an education, says James. That's not the goal. We need fundamentally a God-given transformation in Christ. That's what we need. Education will be there, but the need really is a God-given transformation. And if we need that, and if that's what we are to have, we need to really heed the warning from James of the dangers of confusing the two. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we pray and Lord, we thank you for your word. And we thank you, Lord, that you will remind us that we are to be doers and not hearers only. And we thank you, Lord, that you are a God who changes and transforms us, a God who is patient with us in declaring your word to us, in planting it in us, and persevering with us. We pray, Lord, you would make us a people who persevere with you and with ourselves as we seek to become more like you. And we pray, Lord, that, Lord, as we look into the mirror of your word, as each week, as each day, as we are confronted by it, as you reveal things about us, as you show us how our pattern of life may not be producing the righteousness of God. You give us um, supernatural strength 
to deal with it. You would fill us with your spirit. You would impress upon us the things that we need to change. You would help us not to be people who are switched on when the door, when we walk in the doors and switch off as we leave. You would impress upon the things that you have to say to us each time. Each time we are looking in your word, we pray you press the lessons deep into us and you not let us escape until we have dealt with them. We pray you would encourage amongst ourselves and more widely, Lord, an environment that seeks to hear and listen and learn of your word and an environment that seeks to apply and grow in it. An environment that seeks your implanted word to blossom and to flourish. An environment where we don't obey your commands, but we embody them. That your word is not just listened to, but your word becomes us. And that we and become true imitators of the word who became flesh. Because as your word is put in us, that we too would example it in every aspect of our character and lives. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.